Willie Mays was called the greatest all-around baseball player ever. The Say Hey Kid had a professional baseball career that spanned four decades, beginning with the Negro Leagues in the late 1940s and ending with the New York Mets in 1972. In between, he spent 21 years with the New York Giants, who would later move to San Francisco. Uh, folks, he was, uh, of course, known for his stellar play in center field. Uh, and again, he could do it all. He could hit, he could run, he could catch, he could throw. He was indeed an iconic baseball figure. Howard Bryant, sports journalist, author, joins us right now. Uh, Howard, glad to have you here. Um, when we think about baseball players of yesteryear, um, there are these mythical figures, largely because back then you had newspapers and newspaper columnists in terms of how they wrote about them and their exploits. And people often hear the games via radio and you couldn't actually see it on television until, until, until years later. Uh, and, we, and a lot of times people throw around the phrase, the goat or great or iconic. For me, there are few people who sort of fall into that category. Willie Mays was definitely one of them. Yeah, no, no question. And I think that um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough day. I, you know, yesterday was a was a really hard day because when you think about Mays, he's a generation. He is the he's the guy. He's the standard. He's the standard in so many different ways. One of the things that I love about Mays, in addition to his ability, is he really is the first guy when you think about professional athletes whose legacy was in his number. I mean, you think about running backs. Okay, there, there's a generation of running backs who followed number 32 after Jim Brown, whether it was OJ and the rest of them. But the first guy was number 24. Everybody wanted to wear 24 because they wanted to be like Willie Mays. Ricky Henderson wears 24. Mays, Griffey, Mays. You know, Bobby Bonds wanted to wear, Barry wanted to wear, wore 24 in Pittsburgh and then wanted to wear it again when he got to San Francisco. 24 was the number that you wore when you were an out, uh, especially a black outfielder, because you wanted to be like him. You wanted to follow him. He was, you know, he was the guy that everybody was in awe of in terms of being able to do all of the things. And yeah, when Willie played from, from 51 as a rookie, goes to the World Series, and then retires in 73 at 42 in the World Series with the Mets. He was the standard for everything about being a superstar, about being a, a generational star in a city that already had the Yankees and the Dodgers. He's, he's the standard, and, and he always will be, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when, we're, when, we're, when we're talking about play, uh, what's, what's, what I, what's interesting is that, uh, and I've read several books on, on, on Willie Mays and, and his story, um, People talk about, again, what happened on the field. When you think about that generation of athletes, it, if you're talking Jim Brown, if you're talking Bill Russell, if you're talking Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, if you're talking um, Kurt Flood, but we can go on and on and on in terms of players during that period. Um, for Mays, it was all about baseball. Um, he wasn't necessarily uh, this active figure in the civil rights movement, things along those lines. He was focused on the game. Yeah, he was focused on the game, but that's not really accurate, Roland. Okay. It's, um, it's, it's hard for Mays. Like, I, and I, we talk about this a lot when you think about the history of Willie Mays because he, he was the guy in a lot of ways who made it easy for white fans to love him okay. because he was so focused on the game, to your point. He was the guy, he was the anti-Jackie Robinson in a lot of ways, where Robinson wanted to know your politics before you cheered for him. He didn't want you to cheer for him if you didn't have the right politics. <laughs> he, wanted, he wanted you to understand that rooting for him, that supporting him, also meant supporting him as a man. And he put that right in your face. And he put that in your face for the 10 years that he played, and there were people, both black and white, who were tired of the fact that Jackie Robinson was so intense about being black. And the contrast to that was, well, why can't you be more like Willie? Because Willie just made you feel good. Willie made you want to copy his batting stance, even though people copied Jackie's batting stance. Willie made you want to run around and do the basket catch. And Willie was uncomplicated in that way, or Willie appeared to be uncomplicated in that way. 
because Willie didn't put that on you specifically. But Willie Mays came up the same years as Jackie Robinson did. Willie was born in 1931. Willie was passed over by the Boston Red Sox the same way that Jackie Robinson was. Willie trained in spring training in Scottsdale, Arizona, which was a sundown town with the Giants, with the New York Giants, which meant that no blacks were allowed after sundown in Scottsdale. So Willie had to stay 17 miles away from his teammates in Phoenix. So Willie went through all of it. Willie was humiliated. When Willie went to San Francisco, liberal San Francisco, he couldn't buy a house yep. in the peninsula, even though he was Willie Mays. And everybody cheered for Willie, and everybody wanted to be like Willie, but they didn't want Willie to live next door. And Willie held a lot of that in, and Willie didn't carry it the same way Jackie did, because Willie was here to entertain you. And when Jackie wrote his uh, second uh, memoir, not really a memoir, but he wrote another book called Baseball Has Done It in 1964, he criticized Willie for it. You're the guy that everybody loves. You're the best player in the game. Maybe you're the best player any of us have ever seen. Why aren't you using your power? Why aren't you using your influence to get people to also cheer for you and recognize they've got a responsibility that comes with cheering for you? And Willie was in a real difficult spot because it wasn't Willie's way to be like Jackie. So I understood it. I mean, everybody carries it differently. Right. And it's, it doesn't mean that Willie didn't carry it. He just didn't display it the way Jackie did. So um, I'm not going to name the famous baseball player. But one of the things that he said was he said that if you look at the major records in baseball, this person said, Willie didn't hold any of them. So how could he, uh, uh, when I tell you offline, you're gonna crack up laughing. Uh, but then again, knowing you, you probably already know. Um, so when you hear that, when you hear that stated, but he was considered all around greatest baseball player ever, how, what, 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 what made him so, Easy. Well, number, yeah. number number one, this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult in baseball today, because baseball baseball has turned selling the game into selling math. They sell analytics. They sell numbers. They sell all these things. And Willie was not defined by any of those things. Willie Mays, when you saw Willie Mays was eye test central. You watched him. You saw electricity. You wanted to emulate him. You saw if you were a baseball person, you knew the difference between the guy who put up numbers and the guy who could play. You saw Willie do things that guys couldn't do. When people talk about, you just showed the clip of Willie making the catch in 54 in game one of the World Series. But what that clip doesn't show, if you ever want to show it again, watch how far back Willie's going. Deep center field in the polo grounds was 485 feet. That's how far he's running to make that catch. Mm. I mean, he's the, the ballpark doesn't go that far anymore. It shows you what an athlete, what a ball player he was. This isn't about numbers. This is about what you're seeing and how this man is making you feel. This is what sports is supposed to be all about. You know, we don't it's not an algebra test, launch angle and exit velocity and all the stuff that they sell the game on now. Willie was kinetic. Willie made you want to go outside and play baseball. He made you want to go out and watch baseball. And also, he did put up the numbers. He did hit 345 one year. He did hit 51 home runs one year. He did hit 52 home runs one year. He also missed two years to the military in 52 and 53. So if you add nah, about at that those years, he was hitting 40, 45, 50 home runs a year. He breaks Ruth's record before Hank Aaron does. So it's not like Willie didn't have the numbers. So let's face it. Willie also had 500 home runs and 3,000 hits, 32.83. So as, as much as you may want to look at those numbers and go, OK, Willie didn't end with all the numbers. He was the, he was absolutely the leader of a lot of those numbers when he was playing. I think it's hilarious you were talking about that catch. Uh, this was an old timers game, so for a lot of people don't know, they used to literally have these games, but then too many of these old timers were getting hurt in these games, uh, <laughs> and because they was they they were athletes and they 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 so like the brain was like 
go catch that ball. Um, th this is an example. This is Willie Mays at 50 years old playing center field. Um, this is, uh, and so, and he chases, he chases this down, makes, you know, falls down, and he's like, damn. <laughs> like, what the hell was I thinking? Uh, but you put him out in center field with a glove, he is going to go after it because the fans are watching. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that hamstring. That hamstring hurts. <laughs> But again, that's, I mean, again, when you, when you put a guy like that on the field, they are going to perform. Well, and that's the thing with Mays is that he's also, you know, representative of the great, the, you know, the greatest generation, that golden, that golden era of New York baseball. You had, you know, the Giants, the Dodgers and the Yankees all in the World Series during those years. You had Jackie Robinson. You had Roy Campanella. You had Willie Mays. You had Monty Irvin. You had all these guys playing in, in, in New York, and, and it really was the moment where baseball, this was when baseball was the sport that was leading in race relations as well, not because everything was great in the sport, but because it was the sport that did it first. And if you wanted to see black competition against white, com it, you didn't go to the NFL for that yet. Yep. You didn't go to you didn't go to the NBA for that yet. You had to go to Major League Baseball. And, and while you're saying that, this is video here of Ernie Banks, Frank Robinson, uh, Hank Aaron, and uh, Henry Aaron and Willie Mays all together at an All Star game. That's yeah, and, that's a hell of a lineup there. And and don't forget that those black players, because you look at those guys. You see Mays came up in 51. You see Banks came up in 53. Henry came up in 54. Frank came up in 54. Those guys took those All-Star games seriously because the American League didn't integrate as quickly. They refused to integrate. Outside of the Cleveland Indians, most of those teams didn't want to integrate, including the Yankees and, of course, the Red Sox. And so the black players took the All-Star game very seriously, and they dominated the American League as a, as a message to say, hey, you guys kept us out, and we're going to show you the mistake that you made by keeping us out, by killing you every summer during the Midsummer Classic. This is, um, th this is a video we've seen a lot, Willie Mays uh, playing stickball with the kids in New York City. I also think what, 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 is, what is so different about, obviously, players back then, and not just baseball players. I think when you think, when you think about Muhammad Ali, when he would be walking the streets of Harlem, when you think about, when you think about, um, uh, when you think about Joe Lewis and all his, mm -hmm. I mean, here's a piece I think people forget. They couldn't live many places. So yeah. they were living right there where everybody else was, who, who was black. So their interactions with kids and adults in restaurants and stores because they could not live in the suburb, in the mansions. And so their connection to the community, I, I just, and it, it's not a diss on players after them, but it's just a different relationship because you actually could see them, touch them, talk to them. Well, not, and not only that, but this is, this, this is what happens when the game becomes a business, when it becomes an industry. Back then, Willie Mays signed his first contract. He was making $5,000 a year. And so, and yes, he could only, you know, you're living in Harlem, the, the, the polo grounds are in Harlem, and you're looking at uh, th this guy as a member of the community. He's a part of you. His, his kids and Jackie Robinson's kids, they're going to school. They're in the school system. They're in the school district. You watch them, and they are, these are the things that we lose when we talk about all of the money and the changes in the game and everything else. And that's why people have so much nostalgia for it. Because you, when you watch a player like Mays, you're not just thinking about him. You're also thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your time and you're thinking about the games on the radio. And that's the difference that baseball, it's the power of baseball. You're thinking about your family and, you know, listening to the games on the radio with your family. You know, my dad and I used to watch the games or we used to go to the games or whatever. And Mays, Mays represented so much of that, and he represented it on two coasts. And once again, when you think about the people that make you want to care about sports, you don't have that in baseball today. You know, there's, no, there's no LeBron James equivalent in baseball today. There was a time when Willie Mays is the most famous name in sports. Those days in baseball are long over. Yep. It's all gone. And so when you think about 
when when you think about as we get older, we protect our own time. We're thinking about our time as well and the years that we've traveled and the people that we loved who aren't here anymore. And how much I remember listening to the old timers when I was in my 20s telling me, yeah, you know, if you never saw Mays play, you didn't know baseball. And if you didn't see Jim Brown, you don't know football. And so it all of it, especially for black people during that period, because this is the it's the integration era in the 20th century uh, of sports. It's that second age from the immigration to integration to economics. This is the period where black people become front and center in the culture. It didn't happen Mm -hmm. with the doctors and the lawyers and the professors. It happened with the athletes. And Mays was one of the first guys that we saw. Robert? And, and we talk about this all the time, the lack of the black participation in baseball today. And, you know, my dad grew up or lived in Harlem at the time. He went to the Polo Grams. He went to Ebbets Field. Um, I grew up kind of immersed in that culture. What do you think has to happen for this new generation to have that same connection to the sport uh, that they used to have? And then I, I think about it all the time. I was watching the UFL championship game this weekend, thinking to myself that there's a kick returner uh, who's never going to make it in the NFL, but who will make a hell of a center fielder can make a half billion dollar playing, but they just don't have the focus to actually build that as a skill. What do you think it will take to get us back to being the baseball culture? Well, I think what's been lost is the money. When I talk about baseball, you know, base, baseball is a white suburban sport reinforced by foreign labor. That's what baseball is. Mm-hmm. Baseball used to be an American game. And that American game was always looking for the cheapest source of of talent. Back in the day, it was the Negro Leagues. That's where you went for your talent. Today, baseball has billions of dollars of infrastructure in the Dominican Republic and in Venezuela, and that's where they look for their players. And the fact that the game, that the money is so big now, baseball does not develop its own players anymore. So baseball is going to college. College baseball is less than 2% African-American. So the reason why there's only 6.3% black participation in the sport now is because you're not looking for black people to play your sport. The reason why you had so many black players back in the day was because baseball didn't have to compete for them. Now baseball has to compete for that African-American player with basketball, with football, because the other sports will pay for you to play. The college will pay for you to come play basketball. They will pay for you to play football. But but baseball is a non-revenue college sport. So nobody's paying for black people to develop their baseball skills. And now that that infrastructure has shifted to the Dominican Republic, black players are disappearing. And I've always said that, you know, it's such a cop out to say, um, well, you know, black kids would rather play football and they'd rather play basketball. Not true. You put a ball in front of a kid, he's going to play with it. There's no question about that. The question is, is that baseball has priced itself out of the black player. It's not looking for the black player. It doesn't want to compete for the black player. And that's why they have all these initiatives now to try to get those players back. Rebecca. You know, earlier you talked about um, Willie Mays' um, numbers and how it isn't as comparable to others. Um, I I think that was your point. So if we were to add um, his numbers from playing in the Negro Leagues and add it to his numbers playing for MLB, what is his overall numbers and how does that compare with other greats in baseball? Yeah, well, they wouldn't be that different because Mays was only in the Negro Leagues for not even a year. Um, he played for the Birmingham Black Barons, I think, in 48. Well, in fact, he was he was quoted last week, uh, Howard. He was like, hey, that's pretty cool. I had, what did he say, I had 100 hits at it? Exactly. When they brought the Negro League records, he was like, okay, he said, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Willie, you know, he was he was in the he was in the tail and it, the Negro Leagues wouldn't have made a difference for him in terms of his numbers. His numbers were enormous. Let's not, you know, OK, Henry put up huge numbers. Bonds put up huge numbers. He would have. I think I do believe Mays would have gotten to 714 homers had he not missed two years in the military. But Willie Mays put up enormous numbers. Right. 3000 hits, 500, 660 home runs. So 500 plus home runs, uh, you know, 1900 RBIs. 
This man played 13 straight years in center field at 150 games or more. He's he's a giant, and no matter how you you know, however you want to cut it, if you want to do it by the numbers, go ahead. If you want to do it by the eye test, go ahead. However you want, if you want to do it just by name recognition and reputation, one of the things that I always tell players is that that we think that you're going to survive time, but time replaces all of us. It hasn't replaced Willie Mays. And because he was that big and there are certain guys that are the, you know, they're the Mount, you know, they're, they're the Mount Rushmore. They're the Everest of the game. And, and he was one of them. He is still the guy that everybody compares when you're looking at five, two players. Can you hit for average, hit for power, run, catch and throw? He could do everything. Uh, I, I do find it interesting, though, uh, and I saw this clip and I want to get your thoughts. Uh, because he was asked, hey, who do you think is the greatest player of all time? And look, it's very few people say, hey, me. He, uh, I I but he said this here. Listen. He was the best player other than Willie Mays in New York. I mean, on your of your teammates. Oh, uh, it, it, it's, I, I hate to say this, Joe, but uh, my best player, the guy that I pick, uh, wasn't my teammate. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was... Uh, Roberto Clemente, uh, who played uh, with the Pirates. Uh, I first saw Clemente in uh, 1954 down in Puerto Rico. Uh, I had to go out and help him in any ways as far as ground ball is concerned, but he could throw, he could run, he could hit. He could do just about everything, and I think he was uh, pretty close to anybody that played baseball-wise. Uh, he didn't hit a lot of home runs, but he will carry you downtown. You know, he, he hit 25, 26 right now. And today, they call that a, a superstar, a 25 home run, you know. But in those days, he was just a mediocre a home run hitter. He wasn't a home run hitter then. But I, the reason I didn't have, a, didn't pick my teammate is that maybe uh, – I look at things different when he talk when it comes to players, and uh, I think Clemente was a. Uh... He was uh, Clemente was a hell of a baseball player. Oh, and once again, and and go talk to my late great friend Henry Aaron, as our friend Henry, and 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 Henry Henry got uh, what did he win? One Gold Glove or two Gold Gloves, and then Clemente won them all in right field. He's you know, <laughs> they were just two. And I think that's one of the other things about that time period, Rowan, is that because baseball was so far ahead of the other sports. And because integration had taken so long, you had this unbelievable glut of talent. I mean, let's not forget, Frank Robinson was out there in right field, too. So you had Henry, Clemente, and, you know, Mays in the outfield. You had an Aaron in right field. You had all of these players. You had so many of these great players. And the beauty of it was was that they had something to prove. They were not detached from the black struggle. They were involved in the black struggle, and that includes mm-hmm. Clemente, because one of the things I love about Clemente was that he's one of the few Latino players who identified as black, mm. he saw himself in the black struggle. Today, there's this, you know, the 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 story of Pan-Africanism in sports, in baseball especially, doesn't really exist. You talk to a black player in the Dominican Republic, they want to fight you. They're not black, they're Dominican. And so this is one of the things where you— you make a, a, a concerted effort to to mention the black players for being black because those players at that time, they, you know, as much as Mays got criticized for not being as vocal as Aaron or not being as vocal as, as Jackie, you know, you talk to Mays. I remember when I first time I interviewed him, he told he told you all about what he went through as well and how much it hurt him that people looked at him as though he wasn't committed to black people. Um, simply because he was out there making everybody enjoy themselves too. Willie, Willie had a lot of scars. Indeed, uh, and you know one of the things that drives me crazy uh, when I and I, I really do look at some of these baseball writers and think, what the hell were you thinking? Uh, and I look at the numbers: ninety-four point seven percent of the ballots. How in the hell was Willie Mays, along with so many others, not a unanimous selection uh, to the Hall of Fame? Is just beyond me. Well, as a Hall of Fame voter, um, you know, I, I it, it doesn't bother me nearly that much. I mean, I know. I mean, Aaron got a pretty, you know, Tom Seaver was, what, 98.3, I mean, 90, a little higher than that. You know, Mariano Rivera is the first unanimous and probably not the last because people look at it differently. Back then, it was old school. It was just different. There were some guys on the, you know, some voters just wouldn't vote for you on the first ballot no matter what. 
So, but once again, there was no, I mean, Jackie Robinson got 77.5% first ballot Hall of Fame. He had to get 75. So he squeaked right in and he's Jackie Robinson. Well, so, let, well, let, let's also keep in mind uh, the uh, baseball press box was extremely racist as well. <laughs> was? Is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're in it, so you can speak to today. Uh, uh, so 100% right. There you go. Al Brian, always good to see you, my brother. Uh, I, look, you always got some book you're working on. So, what, what, what was the most recent book that came out? Oh, you mean the most one I'm working on? But I'm about to log off right now. I've got two weeks to finish this next book. I am doing a. Um, I'm writing the story of July 18th, 1949. And that was when Jackie Robinson testified against Paul Robeson on American Activities Committee. It's a story of these two uh, gigantic black men being pitted against each other in service of white America during the Cold War. I uh, cannot wait to read that. That's not just... That's not, I cannot wait to finish it. That's not a, that's not an <laughs> athletic book. That that is a that's a that's a history book, Cold War, all that stuff combined. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that uh, is uh, I can't, definitely can't wait. So we're gonna let you go so you can go finish that book. How Brad, my brother, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, now thank you, Roland. COVID happened, poor people were dying at a rate already of 800 people a day before COVID. If you went to a funeral every single day, it would take you 600 years to attend all the funerals of the people who will die from the ravages of policy violence, poverty, and low wages in America in just one year. It would take you two years and 19 days to go to all of the funerals of the people that will die today and oftentimes Silence. Nobody talks about this political genocide, but we are determined today to remember their death and be a resurrection of voting power and voice power like never before. Economic justice and saving this democracy are deeply connected. We as a nation must listen to the demands of the poor who are pushing and will continue to push political candidates and elected leaders to lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. We are the poor, the marginalized, and the underpaid. And we are taking one step forward to say that everybody has a right to live. Poverty is not the fault of those who are impoverished. It is caused by those who make the policy. There are over 135 million poor and low wage, low income people in this nation. The biggest block of potential voters by far is low income, low wage voters. I can't afford medicine. Sometimes I have to skip because of the cost. The farm worker community is tired of the violence imposed upon us by greed, exclusion, and denial of basic human rights. Those folk that represented by that casket, poor and low wage workers who are the most moral people in this country because they go to work every day believing even though going to work is hazardous to their health. I'm tired of working 70 to 80 hours a week and still not have money for the necessity of bills. I'm tired of getting sick and not being able to go see the doctor. Having to make a choice to pay between rent or the light bill or food or clothes. You cannot claim to care about families and a culture of life and then do everything in your power to rob people of equal access to resources and to force them to live in poverty. Leadership of both parties that waged war on poor people and low wage workers. And this government has treated people experiencing poverty, including their military families, with disdainful, deliberate, malicious neglect. So the truth is that my son died from poverty. We refuse to accept poverty as the fourth leading cause of death. The fourth leading cause of death in this, the richest country in the world. We march today for our children and the generations to come. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. We will voice our demands and register our vote. When we stand up 
And when we stand together, things change. There is the electorate that is, and then there is the electorate that should be. 34 million eligible poor and low-income voters did not vote in 2016. If just 20% of those voters in swing states were mobilized around an agenda, they could change the political outcome of every election. So we're launching the most massive voter mobilization and turnout campaign in history of poor and low-wage voters, allies, and religious leaders. People are dying, but we know it doesn't have to be this way. And so we are calling on everyone to join us in this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. We are here, we will be seen, we will be heard, and our power will be felt. We don't need to be an insurrection. We are a resurrection that will be felt across this country. Are you ready? 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 We are a resurrection. And we are ready.